And welcome back to Kidman Talk. This is episode 152. My name is Carl Bastian. I'm the founder of Kidology.org, children's pastor here in Colorado. And always a delight to spend some time with you, whether you're listening on iTunes or watching on Facebook or YouTube or right on Kidology.org forward slash podcast. Try to push this out in as many different ways and places as I can to make it accessible to you. Today's topic is shepherd or sheep herder. And it's based on an article that I wrote many years ago, but it's one of those timeless principles that I think is worth addressing again. In fact, as I've been praying about the topics and scope for the podcast this year, I've decided to hone in on 12 overarching arenas of ministry that are important for every children's pastor to address. And so I'm going to bring a new one of those every year. And I'm starting out with my number one favorite, which is the fact that as children's ministry leaders, we are first and foremost shepherds. This is a season of evaluating and planning. And so I hope that if you're listening to this early in the year, it's going to be great encouragement to you. So let's talk Kidman. Hey, now I often have a sponsor or a featured resource for this podcast. I just want to make you aware of something that exists on Kidology that you may not be aware of. I can't call it a sponsor because sponsors help financially support our ministry. Kidology is a nonprofit organization. And so while we love to help promote and uh, help you be aware of ministries and resources out there, the one I want to tell you about is one where we actually give away resources and help. And so what I want to tell you about briefly is the Kidology Foundation. Now, using the word foundation is always a little confusing and could be misleading because it gives the impression that there's some vast sum of money in a bank somewhere earning interest and um, and then off that interest, you know, we give out grants. Um, if you've got a big lump of money and you want to donate it to Kidology, I would love to set up that kind of a foundation, but that is not the kind of foundation that Kidology's foundation is. Kidology's foundation is a commitment to be a giving organization at the core because I believe that one man withholds and comes to ruin and another lives generously and prospers. I think you know where that's found in the book of Proverbs. It's right on the opening page of my book, A Bright Idea. It's been at the core of my philosophy uh, for how I want to run my life as well as my ministry. And I realized that early on, if we wait till we have money to give, we'll never be a giving organization. Giving has to be something you do regardless of of means, right? I love the old joke about the farmer who came into the to the farmhouse saying, "Honey, honey, we're so blessed. The Lord gave us two calves." And he says, "To show our gratitude to God, we will keep one calf and we'll give the other calf to the Lord." Well, the next day he came into the farmhouse and he looked kind of sad and his wife said, "What happened?" And he said, "The Lord's calf died." <laughs> You see, we tend to keep our first fruits and just give away our excess to the Lord. And I'll give you one more giving joke that you can use. You know, there once was a man who said to his pastor, well, I'll give when I have more money. And he said, if you had a million dollars, how much would he give? He said, oh, if I had a million dollars, I would give half to the Lord. He said, that's fantastic. What if you had a hundred thousand dollars? He said, I would still give half to the Lord. He says, what if you had a thousand dollars? I tithe off that. He said, what if you had $10 in your wallet? Knowing he probably did have $10 in his wallet. See, it's easy to say you'll give away half or, or you would tithe when you imagine some great amount, but what will you do with what you have? And that's why early on when Kidology started, I wanted this ministry to be a giving organization. So even as we're a nonprofit, we're dependent on donations and memberships. And while memberships are income, they're technically a donation. That's why we'll give a free membership to anyone who asks because we don't want to keep anyone away from the resources. At the same time, we want to be a giving 
organization. And so often we are giving and supporting other ministries, not only financially, but often with technical help and support. You'd be surprised how many children's ministry websites out there, um, Kidologies played a role in helping them get started, sometimes even helping to build their website and get them up and going, because that's just part of who we are and what we love to do. But with 2021, with a new year, I wanted to bring back something uh, that we have not done in a while. In fact, um, we as a team are reviewing the website um, over at the end of last year. And I was looking at our foundation page, which is kidology.org forward slash foundation. And we came upon some old pictures that were still on that page of some grants that we had done quite a long time ago. In fact, there was a, a really cool picture of Brian Dollar. Many of you know who Brian is. A long time ago before High Voltage Kids, Brian was a recipient of a Kidology grant where we bought him a Palm Pilot. Now, some of you younger listeners may not even know what a Palm Pilot is because the iPhone did not even exist yet. Maybe I'll drop that picture of Brian in the show notes at kidology.org forward slash Kidman Talk 152 and you can see what a youthful Brian Dollar looks like. He's still pretty youthful looking. Um, so we've decided to bring that back. So if you go to kidology.org forward slash foundation and you'll see right at the top uh, a button where you can click to something that we are calling a Kidology grant. In fact, I'm going to type it in here just so I give you the exact right wording. And you'll see their new in 2021 ministry grant. So you'll see a button there to click off. And you, or you can just go to slash grant, I see. And we want to bless your socks off. This is something we want to do for small ministries. I'm not going to take much more time in this podcast to tell you about it. But if you're a small ministry, because, you know, there are churches that I know, because I used to be in ministries like this many times, where a gift of literally a couple hundred bucks can go a long way. And there in the past, we've given away puppet stages with some puppets or some other uh, books or other resources. And I want to do that again this year. And so read through that. We want to bless your socks off. There's some criteria for the kind of things we want to do. And the cool thing is that a lot of the resources that you may need in your ministry, Kidology has a relationship with vendors who can often provide those resources. Where, In other words, we can buy those resources at a wholesale discount uh, in order to give them away. And we might actually be able to get them cheaper than even just giving you money to buy them. So if you're a small ministry and you've got a dream for something cool that you would like to do in your ministry and you just don't have the resources to do it, um, then I hope you will check out the grant page on Kidology. And I look forward to seeing what um, scholarship applications that we'll get in this year. Our team will pray about them and review them, and we look forward to granting some of them this year. Well, let's move on to our topic for today. It's called Shepherd or Sheep Herder. Later, you can look this article up on Kidology under kidology.org forward slash sheep or shepherd or sheep herder. You know, it starts out just saying, remember. You know, remember when you first went into children's ministry do you remember the calling that God gave you, that, that burden you had for children, that, that awesome responsibility that you felt, that the urgency you felt, you know, back when reaching kids was, was all that it was about? You know, you might have even been a volunteer who was one of those super mega volunteers who was just always at the church building props, directing plays, teaching Sunday school, maybe leading a puppet team. And somehow, because of your time involvement and talents and skills and passion, you may have ended up being put in charge of the children's ministry. And then what happens often to us is the more in charge we get or the more authority or responsibility, I should say, um, as, as all that admin grows, sometimes we can get a little further away from even the things that we used to do, that we used to love doing, and we don't even find that we get to do them anymore. Um, you know, what changes? You know, we went into kids ministry because we wanted to be a shepherd of kids. But all too soon, 
we become a little bit of a sheep herder, you know, just making sure they get there and get there and have the supplies and have the curriculum and have things printed and have the rooms ready. And of course, the background checks and making sure the rooms are safe and, and all these things that we do that are, that are all so important. The management of the ministry can, can rob us from so much of what originally brought us into it. In fact, I know that sometimes there are children's pastors who have left the ministry and gone back to being a volunteer because they're like, you know what, I kind of actually liked it better when I wasn't in charge of the whole thing, even though there was an attraction to being able to be in charge and make some of the decisions that maybe you didn't like the, the, the decisions, how they were made before. And now you get to be the one that makes the decisions and yet it, it's pulled you away. Well, I want to encourage you that it doesn't have to be that way. You can remain a shepherd even as you begin to lead a children's ministry. Now, kids' ministry, it's gone nuts. I mean, it, it's been less than a hundred years that there's even been a children's ministry. When I was a kid, there weren't even a such thing as a children's pastor, not even children's directors. There were CE directors who oversaw all education in the church. And the children's ministry was pretty much done by the Sunday school ladies, right? You know, these the ladies that then the moms who just were a part of volunteering and running uh, the children's ministry. And now, like, it's this menacing galactic empire, right? And there's all these programs and all these expectations. And in some ways, it's great because there's tons of resources and websites and curriculums and books and, and tools now. But you have to ask, how did the church survive for so many generations and actually produce some pretty godly saints without the trappings of our modern ministry. You know, perhaps dare we say that all of our advances are actually a part of the problem. Could it be that we've created, that, that all that we've created to help us has actually become part of a hindrance? The entire industry of resources and programs, and I'll admit, Kidology is a website full of resources. You know, it's exploded, but what do we have to show for it? And we know that the statistics seem to suggest that kids might be worse off than ever before. Now, I don't think that's the church's fault. I think there are cultural issues going on. I think the church has done a great job. I think there's a, a little too much of blaming the church going on. And I think sometimes these stats get exaggerated because it sells stuff, quite frankly. And I think there is a natural progression of kids growing up in the church and, and leaving and need to discover faith on their own. I think that's a natural pattern. I think there used to be cultural pressure to remain religious, uh, but wasn't necessarily legitimate relationship with Christ. It was it was just religiosity. And so kids having the freedom to leave the church and be true to who they are and become parents and come back to church, that, that's a healthy thing. Um, it's hard to watch, but when they do come back and they own the faith and it's their faith, um, that's a good thing. But, but, but we still have to ask, what has gone wrong if we're doing all kinds of programming and have all these tools and all these resources if we don't feel like we're making disciples like we once did. And I'd like to suggest that the issue is that we have forgotten our calling to be shepherds. Let, let me share uh, a couple of scriptures with you on this podcast. One that I love is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, where it says, Keep watch over yourselves. And all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Notice it doesn't say be administrators, be managers, be CEOs. No, be shepherds of the church of God. And to keep watch over the flock that, that you've been entrusted to oversee you know, I've always loved the title children's pastor. You know, it's kind of funny. I thought I made up that title because it was kind of new when I went into ministry. When I first became a children's pastor, I was offered the position of being the coordinator of the children's ministry. And I was excited to, you know, take on this responsibility. The church that I was first on staff at, the Moody Church in Chicago, um, it had had a CE director who oversaw everything. And when he left, 
they decide to parcel up his responsibilities, not replace that position. And so all the different areas he oversaw were given out to different staff members, but they were left with kind of like this kid piece. And I'd already volunteered to be doing children's church. And so I was this college kid, you know, doing kids church. And so they kind of approached me and like, hey, you want a part-time job? You could be the coordinator of the children's ministry. And, you know, they had a lead pastor, associate pastor, a youth pastor, a worship pastor, a seniors pastor, a missions pastor. And and, and I just kind of gently, very gently, because I wanted the job, gently pushed back and said, any chance I can be the children's pastor. Now, they, they titled everything Pastor Of. So it was Pastor Of Adults and Pastor Of Youth and Pastor Of Missions and Pastor Of Worship. And so I said, can I be the pastor of the children? Well, I don't think they cared what I called myself. They said, yeah, you can be the pastor of the kids. Um, but I was so excited to to be able to say to the kids, there's a pastor for you now. You get your own pastor. In fact, uh, at one of the churches I served at, I shared that story. And um uh, I made the joke that I probably could have uh, asked to be called the emperor of children's ministry, and they probably would have agreed to that. And so my first day on the job at one of my churches, the pastor put the name plaque on my door, uh, emperor of children's ministry, because <laughs> he was like, we don't care what you call yourself, just run the kids' ministry. Um, but, but the reality is, all titles aside, you are a children's pastor. You and the word pastor comes from shepherding. You are a shepherd of the children. Now, don't get hung up on your title. You might be a coordinator. You might be a director. You might be a, a pastor, or maybe you want to be a pastor, and and you're not allowed to be a pastor because of limitations in your church or denomination on on who can have that title. Maybe you have to be ordained or licensed. I know in some denominations, women can't have the title of pastor, and and that can feel unfair because, you know, if they hire a man, does the exact same job, he gets to be a pastor. You know, let's not debate that. Embrace the fact that it is your, not your title that defines you, it is your actions and it's your role. So I don't care what your business card says or what the sign on your door says, you are a shepherd to the children. I don't care what they call me because I have no interest in coordinating coordinating kids. I want to pastor kids. So choose to be a shepherd of the kids. Say, you can call me the janitor of the children's ministry. I don't care. I want to be a shepherd of the kids because what you, your identity and how you identify yourself is going to make a difference in how you um, operate as your ministry. In fact, let me read another verse to you from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. It says, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, eager to serve. See, if that's you, eager to serve, not doing it because you must do it, and, and none of us do, right? But because you're willing, then then serve as serve as a shepherd. Embrace that role, whether you're paid or not, whether you're full-time or part-time. It's irrelevant. Embrace that you are a shepherd. So the question becomes then, how do I get shepherding back to being front and center in my ministry when I'm responsible for so much administratively? Um, and I tell you, it begins with asking some really hard questions. Now, I might frustrate you a little in this podcast because I'm not going to give you a whole lot of answers, okay? Because I don't, because everyone's answers are going to be different, all right? But what I want to do is give you the courage and the encouragement to answer these questions boldly and creatively within your ministry so that you can be a shepherd and not just an administrator, all right? So I'm going to ask you some tough questions. And you might need to listen to this again. You might need to go to the website and download the PDF that I'm walking through and take some a journal, get some time to go for a walk or to a coffee shop or find a quiet place and really think through these questions. And the first question is this, what do you think it means to be a shepherd? You know, don't bother trying to come up with a perfect definition. Just describe what, what does that mean to you that I'm a shepherd of the children? And, and write down some key words, whether it's whether it's guiding, whether it's protecting, whether it's fighting on the behalf of. Describe what that means and then think about your ministry and go, what do I do that encompasses those 
key words that I wrote down or that description. You know, if, if let me give you one example, if it's protecting you, what, what can I do to protect the kids? You think, well, where do kids need protection today? Do they need protection online? Am I equipping families um, to keep their kids safe online? Am I, am I teaching them about the tools and the websites and the links and the things that they can use to protect their kids online? Um, and, I'm, and I'm just throwing out one example. All right, next question. What aspects of your ministry can be described as shepherding? Now, this is just between you and God, all right? And you can be brutally honest because you're not sharing this with your boss or anybody else. Um, but is there something in your ministry that you would describe as shepherding or that someone else would describe as shepherding? And, and be, be, uh, be proud of that. Um, and then what are your programs actually successful at? List everything you do, all of the programs, your official programs have a name and they're on the website and then and even the other things you do. And then write down what the purpose of them is and how do you measure success and are they actually successful and, and give them, kind of, kind of rate them on a shepherding scale from one to 10. Is this a 10 on the shepherding scale? Now, there's evangelism scales, there's education scales, there's outreach scales. So shepherding isn't the only scale. But rate them on the shepherding scale. How much do they shepherd the kids in your ministry? Now, something may be very low on the shepherding scale. That doesn't mean you don't do it because it may be very high on another scale. But, but you're evaluating that. All right. And then ask yourself, what consumes your time? All right. How effective is it? Take a hard look at what you spend most of your time doing it. Um, doing and 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 is it a sh- is it shepherding? How much of your time would you say fifty percent of your time is spent shepherding the ministry? Is it twenty percent? Is it ten percent? And I'm not going to tell you what percent it should be, but I do know of pastors who have made a radical changes in their ministry to say, man, I was spending the bulk of my time being a teacher, and I wanted to be more of a shepherd, so I had to. I had to disengage from some of my teaching activities so I'd have more time for shepherding. That's a personal decision that you need to make. So here, here's, a, here's a tough question, all right? What if you stopped it, nobody would notice? What, is there something in your ministry that you're doing that if you just quit doing it, nobody, nobody would notice? Nobody would say, hey, you haven't done such and such for a while. Sometimes you can even experiment. If you're watching this currently during the COVID and everything, it's a good time to to maybe experiment. You can always blame COVID, right? And see if anyone even notices that you're not doing something. Or when you get back to more normal ministry, see who asked you to resume that. Hey, when are you going to start such and such back up again? If they never ask, maybe that was a focus of your time and energy that was not worth the time and energy that went into it. And then here's the opposite side of that question. What if you started it would surprise and delight people? Think about that. What, what is something that maybe you could start doing? Now, you're like, start doing? Man, my plate's full. Well, that's why you have to think about what you're already doing and what you could quit doing so that you make room for something new. But some days it, 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 could, be a, it could be a small thing. What, what, if it, what if it, oh, I'm trying not to give ideas, but what if it was just some phone calls or emails or notes in the mail or something small that you just started doing that would have a positive impact on your ministry, all right? So after you've taken some time to gather these thoughts, I want to give you five steps that you can just walk through. And if you're watching this at the time it comes out early in 2021, this is a great thing to do early in the year. But no matter when you're listening to this, my goal is always to make these podcasts timeless. So they're helpful years from now or whenever you happen to listen to them. Number one, identify what you'd like to be doing. Write your own job description. You have more control over your time than you would like to believe. So stop making excuses and start doing what you determine is most important. Remember, the most important things in life never happen by chance. They have to be scheduled. So identify what you'd like to be doing and then mark out, I'm going to do that on Monday mornings, beginning of the week. Or I'm going to do that on Wednesday afternoons. I'm going to block out three hours and that's when I'm going to focus on that. 
Identify what you'd like to be doing. Number two, then you've got to evaluate what you are doing. Take a hard look at your time. Sometimes it's worth taking a couple of weeks and actually just mapping out. I had a boss that made us do this as a staff and actually made us keep half hour logs for two weeks of everything we did. It was painstaking, but then, and we didn't have to turn them in because he said, I'm not trying, I don't want you bluffing. I spent five hours in prayer. He says, this, I, I'm just going to require that you do it. You show me that you did it. And then I'm going to have you evaluate where your time is going. And you may find, man, I'm spending four hours a day on email. Maybe you just need to have a block of time once a day. See, I do email from two to 4 PM. And that's it. Anyone that emails me too bad, I'll see it tomorrow at two. And you might have to make a choice like that. All right. Three. So one, identify what you'd like to be doing. Two, evaluate what you are doing. Three, make a list of priorities. All right. This could be the most powerful thing you can do. Make a list of what's most important to you and then put them into your schedule early in the day as possible. And then make sure you do those first. Guess what? You are never going to accomplish everything that you want to do and certainly everything everyone else wants you to do. So you've got to prioritize. Now, you know this. I'm not the first one that you've ever heard say that. But the difference is when 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 you embrace that. All right. Andy Stanley's got that book, Choosing to Cheat. Um, it's a it's a title that makes you go. Oh! But the reality is you have to cheat somebody and something Every day, you can't do everything. You've got the same amount of time as everybody else has, so you have to choose. Number four, choose the best, all right? There's no end to all the good things you can do every day. You've got to say no, and so every day, you've got to decide in the morning, this is what I'm going to get done today, no matter what, and I'm going to do it first. You may find that you've got to start taking advantage of mornings, a good friend of mine has recommended a book called Miracle Morning. I'm not a morning person. I've tried to be a morning person. Everyone's got to find what works for you. But I do take three by five cards, sometimes on a big Sharpie marker, and I write down three things I've got to get done. I love technology. I love apps. I love project management software. But I found that sometimes I just need a three by five card, a giant Sharpie, and I've got to write down on there three things absolutely no matter what got to be done today i love to rip that card up when i accomplish it and throw it in the garbage all right that's my delete button and it's important and then the last one is delegate the rest all right believe it or not god has wired other people to love doing what you don't like doing and there's some things that you just got to delegate and if you've been through any of my coaching or master classes you've heard me say that there are things that someone else could do and I, I break this out in much more detail. I'm not going to do it today. There's things that someone else could do. There's things that someone else would do. There's things that someone else should do <laughs> because really you're not that great at it. Um, and and it's, sometimes it's just a matter of being bold and being willing to ask others to do those things. Or maybe there's things that you just need to stop doing. And if you can't find anyone else to do it, it might be that it's something that's really not even worth being done. Um, I've, I've had a conviction or a principle that I've tried to live by in my life. There's no way I can ever live up to this perfectly, but I try to only do what only I can do. There's some things for my ministry, only I can do them. All right. It's kind of hard to delegate my podcast. If I delegate the podcast, it's not my podcast. However, I have occasionally done guest podcasts. I have had other people do a podcast. I took a break. I did that. I think I've done that a couple of times over the years, but not often because it's my podcast, right? So there are going to be things that only you can do or that are your calling or that are your primary job. If you gave away too much, then your boss might be like, what do we need you for? <laughs> so, um, but, but the rest you can give away. Right? John 10, 12 says, The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. That means that there's some things you just can't give away. Because that hired hand, that volunteer, that person, who's del they're not going to have the same passion. When they see problems and obstacles, pff, they're out of there. Whereas you're going you're gonna to stay in there. You're going to fight. You're going to defend. You're going to take that wolf on even if it's dangerous or you get scratched because you are the shepherd that owns the sheep, all right? 1 Peter 5.8 urges us to be self-controlled and alert because our enemy, 
like an, a lion is prowling around seeking whom he can devour, right? So you've got to be alert. You've got to be ready. So you have to make the conscious decision. I am going to be a shepherd. I am not going to be a sheep herder. And I'm convinced that if you make that commitment and you walk through some of these tough questions, asking yourself what they are, what does it mean to be a shepherd, what are some aspects of my ministry that I would describe as shepherding, and then walk through some of those evaluation questions, go to kidology.org forward slash Kidman Talk 152, download the PDF, then identify what you're doing. Evaluate what you are doing and what you'd like to be doing. Make that list of priorities. Choose the best and delegate the rest. And I know if you do that, this year you can see an increase in your shepherding, a decrease in your management, and I guarantee along with that is going to come an increase in your joy. Because when you love what you do and you do what you love, things are always so much better. I'll see you next time.